Hello Facebook, how are you? It's Dr. Emily from the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Welcome to my office. Just gonna tilt that a little bit. So thank you for joining me. Wanted to do another video to follow up on the video that I did on functional health limitus and the great toe and how they are interconnected with each other. So as I start this, we need to obviously have a little reminder of what functional hallux limitus is. Functional hallux limitus is when open chain, you have very good sufficient dorsiflexion of your first MPJ. However, when the client, athlete, patient gets up and starts walking or moving for whatever reason, they lose that range of motion and they start to jam the first MPJ, which ultimately affects their stride length, how their glutes activate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when it comes to the first MPJ, your great toe joint, you need at least 30 degrees of dorsiflexion when you walk. This is happening right after late mid stance and we go into that terminal phase right before we enter swing. If you do not have that 30 degrees of dorsiflexion, you will start to jam and get a lot of the degeneration and arthritis and obviously pain. Now, whenever it comes to the first MPJ, the great toe, you must factor in the first ray. Your first ray on your foot, we have my foot model here, your first ray on your foot, remember, is the cuneiform metatarsal all the way into that first MPJ. Your first ray does dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. That dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is critical to how you move or dorsiflex your first MPJ. Your spiral fascia line controls the position and mobility of your first ray. The muscle on top Part of your spiral, spiral line is your tibialis anterior. The muscle on the bottom is the peroneus longus. This spiral line must be in balance to dorsiflex your first MPJ. Now, anytime we dorsiflex our first MPJ, you must be able to plantar flex your first ray. So of the spiral line, the muscle that must be sufficiently activated is your peroneus longus so that it can, at the right time, plantar flex the first ray, allowing you to get over your first MPJ. Remember, when it comes to the first MPJ, your foot is moving relative to your big toe. So a lot of the assessments that we do, if we think big toe moving relative to the foot, that does not necessarily translate to walking or to dynamic movement. So when we assess for this, again, we're looking at it dynamically. The foot type that is most susceptible to functional hallux limitus is of course going to be our overpronated foot or the foot that has a medial column instability. Whenever a patient has a break in their medial column stability, whether it is navicular drop or a hypermobility of the first ray, possibly they even have a plantar flex first ray that's going to throw off that spiral line and the timing of getting over their first MPJ. Remember, dynamic. So functional health limitus is not assessed, not in a dynamic setting. If you have insufficient ankle joint dorsiflexion during the late mid stance, so if we have insufficient dorsiflexion when your leg is back here in the late mid stance and you compensate by unlocking and destabilizing your subtalar joint, you are then susceptible to getting functional hallux limitus. So when we start thinking of correctives, one of our correctives must be to address limitation in first or limitation in ankle joint dorsiflexion. So that's going to be our baseline. Baseline we must improve our clients and athletes ankle joint mobility. There's different reasons of why we have insufficient ankle joint mobility. Please remember that certain foot types have a structurally short Achilles tendon, which means their baseline is just not at a lot of ankle joint dorsiflexion. I always have that in the back of the mind. Second one is that they might have a bony block. If they have numerous ankle sprains, perhaps they're a dancer or a runner, and they start to lengthen or destabilize the ligaments on the front of the ankle, now the talus can actually shift forward and they get what's referred to as a bony block. That must be addressed with either a passive mobilization or if you have the, the right to touch, you can mobilize your clients or your athlete or your patient's ankle joint and get that talus into a more posterior position. That will, of course, increase the ankle joint dorsiflexion. Second way that we want to start addressing this is we need to get our intrinsics activated. Your intrinsics are your local stabilizers of your foot, which means that when we walk and we move dynamically, we need those muscles to fire 
first. Our intrinsic muscles is a very deep interconnected myofascial web in the bottom of the foot that is deeply interconnected to your extrinsic muscles or the muscles in your leg. Local muscles first, intrinsics first. The exercise is my go-to, of course, is going to be short foot. Short foot is not just isolated to the abductor hallucis. It gets all of the flexors, which play an important role in foot stabilization. Third exercise, or the third way that we need to start addressing this, is we need to start bringing stability to the medial column. That means that we need to start to lift the navicular if they happen to have navicular drop. Perhaps they need an orthotic to help lift that medial column and that navicular and bring a little bit of stability. That might be the case, especially if they have a hypermobility or a ligament laxity or have had a flat foot for a certain amount of period that now their foot has broken down a little bit. You then will need that structure to help give a little bit of support. If you are looking at it from a neuromuscular perspective and an exercise perspective, this is where we need to start getting our posterior tibialis. Posterior tibialis is the most powerful supinator of your foot, which means it's going to play a very important role in locking the rear foot. I'm going to show you an exercise in a moment. So again, we need to get sufficient ankle joint dorsiflexion, intrinsic muscle activation, posterior tibialis strengthening or medial column strengthening. And then we need to incorporate this with our glutes. Research has shown that if you do up to six weeks of glute strengthening, you can pull an everted subtalar joint into a neutral position. Now the amount of correction that these research studies cited was a two to three degree correction out of that everted position. When you look at orthotics, the average correction or the average post that's placed on an orthotic is roughly two to three degrees. So we can start to see neuromuscular strength can actually match a lot of what these orthotics do, which is why my baseline is always to incorporate neuromuscular coordination. Now the exercise, I've posted this before, it's one of my favorite exercises, it's going to involve the ball that goes between the heel and we are lifting in a short foot position. I will have to tilt the camera a little bit for this and hopefully you can see my feet. So I have a ball, this does not matter, the ball, if you want to use a tennis ball, a cross ball, etc. I have just a little rad roller ball. You're going to place it behind and below your heels. You want to then start by leaning forward if you would like to get your, your flexors activated or you can start to root the tips of your toes down into the ground. So you're essentially doing a slight short foot position. If you lift slightly off of your heels, I'm now driving my heels together to activate my posture tibialis. I'm still pushing my toes down into the ground to get that flexor activation. As I lift up, I'm continuously pushing my toes down into the ground, driving my heels together, and of course I'm getting my pelvic floor to lift at the exact same time and then I will slowly lower myself back down. I want to feel the rotation that is happening in my tibia all the way into my hips. This is also a great way to get your feet, your core, and your glutes to integrate. So again, root the toes down, slight lift of the heels, drive those heels together, keep the toes down into the ground, lift, 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 exhale as you do this. You might start to feel it into the glutes you are here, and then we're gonna slowly lower ourselves back down. This is one of the most effective exercises that I find. You can also start to incorporate general glute strengthening. Again, remembering that our glutes can control that subtalar joint. The key thing, must have that sufficient ankle dorsiflexion. We need to make sure that we are even dealing with a functional health limitus. One last thing that we may be able to add if your client or patient does have a plantar flexed first ray is that you can add what's referred to as a dancer's pad. A dancer's pad will offload the first metatarsal head, allow that first ray to plantar flex at the right moment, and then we would do this exact same exercise with our dancer's pad on our foot. I hope that you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please do type them in and I will always respond. Stay tuned for more live sessions, and remember, stay barefoot strong. Take care.